On the 17th of December, 2010, a man called uh, Mohamed Bouazizi in the uh, town of Sidi Bouzid in Tunisia gets slapped around by the police. He is a fruit salesman and they take away all his wares and he gets furious and he goes to the governorate to complain and nobody listens to him, so he sets himself on fire at about 11.30. And then millions of people take the streets all over the Middle East. So here you have all these countries that consider themselves politically and culturally so different. There's no way you can identify a Tuareg with an Egyptian, for example, and they all at the same time react. So we decide that this is a very interesting moment because one thing is studying the figures, getting the numbers, which you of course interview a lot of people. Another thing is what happens when one of these people who work in the informal economy decide to do something as drastic, as dramatic, as deathly as self-immolation. We then went to find out how many people were doing this, and we found out that in 60 days, there was about 49, and that's what got every country moving. And the interesting thing was that each of these 49 people who self-immolated at that time, they were all businessmen. Businessmen, in, in our sense of the third world, in other words, they, some sold fruit, others manufactured, some repaired uh, computers, others ran restaurants of all walks. And we went in to try and figure out why it is that they had identified. I mean, we did a detailed study of how much fruit there was in the cart that Wazizi had. Uh, what was the uh, what was the value of the pineapples? And all that together with the scales, it was about $225. And of course, when you're poor, you're poor, but $225 isn't enough like to go overboard. It turns out he lost much more. Only it wasn't as visible as the fruit. And what he had lost was, first of all, the right to be there. So his property right on the street. The right to a stall in the central market. Nothing bigger than a small bed. That's all that these people have to sell and he lost both of those rights. And they were uh, customary rights. Uh, if he would have had to do the legal one, it would have been impossible. Nobody's ever done, we found out, as we went through different books, ever done the legal path to getting a stall. So when the police came up and said, we're taking away the wares and we're kicking you out of here, they were in fact expropriating him completely. And since on top of that, all his wares had been bought on credit, informal credit, money lending at that time. He couldn't pay back his debts, so he was bankrupt. But that's only part of his invisible losses. The other one is he was now going to get a title to his home on the basis of which he could have then put up collateral so as to buy the Mitsui truck that he wanted so as to get closer to suppliers in the agricultural field. So that only happens if you've got a good property right over your assets so that you can become really accountable. So he lost his right, therefore, to create collateral. He lost his right to form a company and therefore issue shares. You can't do that unless you have a company. You've got, to be, you've got to be legal. But they were all extra legal. They were expropriated. And at the moment of expropriation is when they say, I'm fed up and I light up. And somehow or other, that is recognized all over the place. Our thesis is that since we have calculated that there's about 200 million Arabs who are also extra-legal or uh, illegal or informal, whatever you want to call them, businessmen that work outside the law, 200 million, that's the army that marched. Self-immolator after self-immolator, economic uh, martyrs, all were expropriated and essentially they died because they had no future left. There was no redress. You see, if you are an entrepreneur, you have dreams, you have possibilities. How I get this asset together with that other asset? And they know very well that to do that, you need law. You can only combine things by contracts and by having a clear property right that you can transfer that is fungible. Now, it doesn't mean that they, they had studied law and economics or the power of institutions. They just know. The way the authorities are organized, the same guy who can take an apple away from your cart, they can do that in the States. I remember Charlie Chaplin films, you know, the cop came and took an apple and took a bite off it. That cop 
can't take away a property right from you. He can't take away your house. He can take away your apples. In these countries, because property rights are in place, he can take away everything. So to us, it was quite clear why people started marching on the streets. That's what it hit it off. And not only that, we couldn't get a political statement or a philosophical statement from any of the families and the surviving self-immolators because 60% of the self-immolators are su survived. Actually, they were, the fire was put out. They were in terrible condition. None of them had anything political to say. All they had to say was something like, you know, we poor people also have the right to buy and sell. They said very down-to-earth commercial and economic things. So we're not saying that that explains everything, the Arab Spring, but it's certainly the missing component. At the end, everybody, I think somehow or other, does understand at one level of understanding or another that uh, this has always been a situation of despair. And though they never got the publicity, the people who did the, the burning, but it's rather guys who did the Twittering and the Facebooking that got all the limelight, they understand that, that all that does is it makes news travel faster. But the substance has got to be, has got to be elsewhere. It's not that I believe that economics is the whole reply, but it is the missing ingredient.